In the perfect coffee world, coffee trees are flourishing. Biodiversity is plenty and productivity is high. Farmers live well of their crop, and consumers, they choose sustainable quality. They also enjoy to drink coffee for its well-being aspect. I think we all in the room here, we agree that that's a nice illustration of the perfect world, but that's not reality. In reality, we're facing an increased imbalance between demand and supply, and uh, we need to help farmers to find ways to adapt to new growing conditions. And how can we, as an industry, transmit the sustainability efforts that we do to consumers to help them choose sustainable quality? And wouldn't it be nice if consumers really chose to drink coffee because of its well-being aspects as part of their healthy lifestyle? What I want to do today is to talk about how science can help us to make our value chain a better one. I'll illustrate this through example of coffee and health. To do this, we're first stepping back in time to 1657. What you see here is the first advertisement on coffee, and this was in London. And as you can read, it has a long list of health claims. Obviously, none of these health claims are scientifically substantiated. At that time, the perception of a few influential people decided what could be said. There were no regulations in place either to avoid misleading information to consumers. The first scientific studies on coffee and health appeared in 1970. What we see here is an example of a paper where the authors look at coffee, tea, cigarettes, and solid fuel. And they look at uh, 20 different countries, and they associate these consumptions with the occurrence of different cancers in these countries. What they find is that coffee, and what they, sorry, the data that they're taking is from trade data. It's not about the consumption, it's from the importing data into the country. And they find that coffee is associated with five different types of cancer. They also find that, that tea is associated to five different cancers, but for cigarettes, only one. <laughs> now, these data, as I said, it's based on import data. The first studies on the actual consumption appeared 20 years later, in about 1990. That time, they started looking at consumer groups. So they would compare similar groups, one was consuming coffee and one would not consume coffee, and they would compare and see what type of diseases these people would get. From these studies, they, could, uh, they concluded, and there were several of these uh, publications, that there was no association between coffee consumption and cancer. So you'd say, everything is fine, there is no association, it's all good. The issue was that the very premature conclusions from the 1970s remained in the mind of people and had created a fear. And it took years of communicating positively about coffee and that there was no impact on cancer and other diseases, to get this out of the mind of people and make them appreciate coffee for what it is. Uh, until now, still a lot of research is being done on consumption of coffee and the appearance and uh, the, cor the correlation to different diseases. What is done now is they're using much larger databases, several hundred thousand people in the study, and they're having very strong statistical modeling tools. They're looking at gender, age, ethnic groups, culture, lifestyle, many different factors. And all of this leads to the conclusion that there is no impact of coffee on, uh, on diseases. There is rather a positive uh, impact. And that coffee would help to reduce the risk of certain diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, liver, colon cancer, um, some neurodegenerative diseases. And there are publications coming out still today. So here are two examples from 15, 2015 and 2014. And they conclude that there are significant inverse associations between coffee and, uh, and diseases, and there is no significant association between coffee and cancer. So that's the state of the art today in terms of human studies. In parallel to these human studies, there was work done on the chemistry of coffee. So 
researchers started to look at what is present in our cup. And they discovered, of course, a lot of aromas. There's a lot of taste compounds in coffee, and there are bioactive compounds. The most well-known bioactive compound is obviously caffeine, and it was really early on discovered that it was the caffeine that impacted our stimulation. Coffee, uh, caffeine was, as such, as a molecule, was actually discovered in 1820. And at that time, it was isolated from the coffee. Now, to isolate it from the coffee, it allowed studying the impact of caffeine itself. So what was also done at that time was to study the toxicity of caffeine. Now, they did this using animal trials. Now, you have to realize we're going back to 1800, and there were no ethnic rules, ethic rules in place uh, regarding animal studies. So what the researchers would do was to feed different animals caffeine and see you know, what the impact was. So, for example, when they uh, had a pregnant rabbit, and they gave the rabbit 30 milligrams of caffeine. So the rabbit would lose its pregnancy, but survive, fine. In another study, they fed a pig weighing 30 kilos, 10 grams of caffeine. So they discovered that it took about two and a half hours for the pig to die. And they, dis the, they attributed the, this to a malfunctioning of the neural system. The first human studies appeared a few years later, in the 1840s, and they reduced the quantity of caffeine, fortunately, a little bit. Uh, so they, by giving a human uh, one and a half grams of caffeine, they would um, discover that it caused vomiting, uh, headaches, palpitations. Uh, so, but uh, the person would survive. Uh, it took another hundred years to 1950 for the discovery of the, uh, another bioactive in coffee, which were the chlorogenic acids. Chlorogenic acids are of the polyphenol group, and these are antioxidants. Now, the study of these molecules was much more complex than caffeine, for two reasons. The first reason is that caffeine is one single molecule, and here we're talking about a whole big group of molecules, and on top of it, upon digestion, you create metabolites that also have a physiological impact. So we're looking at a whole wide range of compounds. For caffeine, the impact is immediate. You can measure heart rate, you can measure stimulation, performance. For the antioxidants, the impact is long-term on health, uh, on disease prevention. So it's much more complex to analyze the exact uh, actives within the chlorogenic acid group and how this impacts uh, disease prevention. From all these studies together, taking the human studies, the chemistry, and the physiology, today we have quite a good understanding of the overall picture uh, that coffee has on our health. There are some independent organizations that look at this overall data. So, for example, the European Food Safety Authority published a paper in 2015 on caffeine safety. And they conclude that consuming 400 milligrams of caffeine a day and 200 milligrams per serving is uh, safe for healthy um, uh, adults. They also recommend for pregnant women to reduce intake to 200 milligrams. Here's an example of uh, another such paper. It's by the IARC, which is a suborganization of the WHO. They look at food and cancer. And, um, they also uh, looked at all the data that are available, all the human data available, and they look at coffee as, a, as an overall beverage, and not at caffeine as for the EFSA. So here it's coffee as a beverage, and they conclude that overall drinking was evaluated as unclassifiable as to its carcinogenicity to humans. As these independent organizations look at all the data that is available, and they're independent, and therefore, we should really take this as the state-of-the-art knowledge that we have today. So that's what we know about coffee and health today. So how about the future? Well, in the last uh, two years, Rico dedicated time both to cold brew and to cascara. That these are new products and new categories that are being uh, uh, coming out on the market at the moment. So cold brew, we talked about, is this a category? and also about the food safety. 
What we did not talk about yet is if cold brew also positively influences our health, like hot brewed coffee. In order to understand if it does, we'd need to make a chemical analysis of cold brew to look at different varieties, different origins, different um, processing conditions, different roast degrees, different extraction uh, methods, and to see how the chemical composition differs from hot brewed coffee. Looking at the similarities and the differences, we can make hypotheses and to understand if uh, cold brew uh, also impacts our health positively like hot brew coffee does. And based on that, to de de uh, design human studies, uh, clinical trials to really understand the impact. In Cascara, the situation is a bit different. What we talked about last year was uh, if Cascara, about the novel food application. So is cascara as such a safe food to consume? What we also have to realize when it comes to cascara is that there might be contaminants that have a much higher, uh, that are much more important to uh, evaluate uh, because these are applied directly on the cherry and not on the bean. On top of it, as we're not heating the product, we're not roasting it, we need to be much more careful about um, contaminations from microbiology and molds. We also have not, no idea at the moment about the health, health impact of cascara. So like for cold brew, we'd need to look at um, the, uh, uh, the chemical composition, again, variety, origin, processing methods, and compare this to hot brewed coffee, and again, design human studies, clinical trials to understand the impact that cascara might have on our long-term health. Why am I bringing this up? Well, as a, in, in the food industry, laws are written to protect consumer safety, which is on the one side ensuring that the product is safe, but also that communications are correct and not misleading. Laws, we want as an industry to avoid laws being written because things fail. A consumer that falls ill this will create unnecessary consumer fear. Therefore, we have an interest as an industry to do science on these products, to really understand what, are the important, what is important in terms of food safety and what is important in terms of communications, and to set our own standards to avoid anything happening uh, around these products. So, so far, I talked about coffee and health, and how, we, how science has helped us uh, to better understand the impact that, that coffee has on our health. So it's the evolution of the science going from singular studies to uh, large human studies, to chemistry, to physiology, and to bring this all together to get a holistic picture. The other topic that is of, or one topic that is of high in, uh, importance to us in the industry today is sustainability. So what can we learn about this methodology regarding sustainability. As a scientist, I'm really interested in applying these, uh, this methodology from going to, from singular studies to more holistic view, also in sustainability. We know already that many things are connected, like, for example, environmental practices, they impact the quality of the coffee. But there are maybe connections that we don't think of in the first place. So, I want to give an example from the wine industry, just to, to illustrate this. So there was a paper that came out recently. It's called The Taste of Pesticides. What the authors did was they looked at two neighboring wine plots, uh, the same variety, the same processing method. The only difference was that one was organic and one was not. And with the sensory experts panel, they found that there were differences between the two. What they discovered was that the difference actually came from the taste of the pesticides. The pesticides itself were flavor active and contributed to the overall flavor of the wine. So when we are doing organic farming, we may want to look beyond the impact that it has on the environment. In coffee, to, sorry, in sustainability today, a lot of research is ongoing. We are looking at new varieties that are adapted to new growing conditions. We're looking at soil quality. We're looking at pesticides, uh, sorry, at, at pest and disease. We're looking at, um, at the water quality of the neighboring river. There are many, uh, a lot of research going on. 
In order to make more thoughtful decisions in sustainability, we should look at a more holistic view on the topics, to look from multiple perspectives. Because we have a lot of data out there, so we can do it. We have data on productivity, we have data on quality, we have data on the, the quality of the water, we have data on uh, agroforestry, on wildlife. We also know if there are decisions taken by the government that might influence the farmers. We also have the farmers. They are an incredibly important source of information because they live coffee every day and they live the sustainability or the, the climate, everything that goes on on the farm. So that's an additional inf uh, factor that we should include in the formula. We have statistical models, uh, tools in place, and by making a multiple, um, by taking a more uh, multiple uh, dim dimensional perspective, looking at different angles to the same problem, I think we can uh, take some steps to make this coffee world a more perfect one. Thank you.